when it comes to the miracles of Jesus, I think this is where a lot of our modern, scientifically inclined minds begin to um, lose a sense of what's happening in the text and what's happening in the ministry of Jesus. Because a miracle, by definition, is something that um, is inexplicable by natural, scientific, physical limitations. Um, you know, the many, many instances throughout Scripture where the laws of nature and science seem to be broken, um, you know, especially when you come to the, the story of Jesus, right? The, the feeding of the 5,000, where a few loaves of bread and, and a couple of fish are uh, blessed and broken and distributed and given to 5,000 men in addition to an unnamed number of women and children and that meager portion you know goes to not only feed that entire multitude to where they're satisfied but at the end of it all the disciples collect 12 baskets of leftovers um, and the baskets, you know, weren't, weren't very small. That, that that kind of a miraculous sign could happen and, and make sense to us. It doesn't make sense, right? And so we, we, we start to um, lose a sense of what Jesus is doing and teaching us, right? You know, be kind to your neighbor, love one another, um, all of those things. You know, follow the commandments in these ways. Those are all things that we can begin to grasp. But to experience miracle in that way isn't something that is very commonplace and so you know when we look to scripture and we look at the miracles that Jesus did you know most of, of his his ministry can actually fall into this description of miracle right the the feeding of the 5,000 that I just mentioned but also uh, all of his healings you know uh, paralytics the blind the deaf uh, the mute those Exorcisms, you know, people possessed by demons or unclean spirits. Um, even raising the dead, right, as he, he did with Lazarus. All of those, those healings, those things that even by today's standards, right, there isn't um, a, a cure-all for uh, blindness or, or deafness. Um, we can do things to resuscitate people, but uh, to actually raise them after they've been dead for... For four days that that goes beyond the limits of our our technological know-how and so for those things to happen it actually has to be some kind of miracle some kind of intervention um, on God's behalf breaking into this world as we know it to make it into the world that God would have it to be and I think that's where that's where we come and we find the rub we as people look at the world and we see it as it is, as we experience it, and cannot imagine a world that is different than what we see, what we feel, what we touch, what we hear, what we smell, you know, our sensory experience. But God has an experience of creation unlike our own. Because our experience, as we have talked about, is, is a broken one. It's a world where death has crept in and inflicts its pain and its, its turmoil on uh, our bodies and on the emotions of loved ones as they watch and weep and mourn uh, their loved one's death. Um, it, it's a world of bitterness and decay and greed and cruelty and all those things that we experience in the world that are not a part of God's good creation, but nevertheless persist with us. And so the things that we look and we see and identify as miracle, I believe, may very well be creation as God intends it, and not something that is abnormal, um, but a glimpse into what God's normal would have us to be. Um, like taking, taking a look at the raising of Lazarus, right? <clears throat> so Jesus and his disciples are traveling around in John's gospel. They have gotten into some trouble with the religious religious leadership in Jerusalem, and they have threatened to kill Jesus um, openly. And so um, Jesus and his disciples leave one of the, the great festivals there, and they go back up into Galilee and continue ministry. 
and uh, word comes to Jesus that his friend Lazarus, who lives in Bethany, and Bethany is about nine miles outside of Jerusalem, so you know, relatively close, um, is very sick. And of course, you know, when your friend is sick and someone sends a runner to deliver that message to you, the, the implication is that you're going to go and you're going to visit that person, um, almost like a, uh, a deathbed request. I remember when my um, grandmother was, was dying uh, in, in 2008, um, she requested to see myself along with, with uh, the rest of her grandchildren. And um, I was relatively young at the time and didn't fully understand what that meant. That, that someone near to death desired to see those uh, whom they loved close by them. And luckily I was able to, to um, be present with her in some of her final moments, but not everyone has that blessing and has that chance. And so a runner comes to Jesus and delivers the news, and Jesus' disciples look and um, they're a little concerned because to go to Bethany to be close to Lazarus would put them very close to the people who had threatened to kill him. And um, Jesus looks at his disciples and he tells them, you know, the sickness will not lead to death. Um, it'll be okay. And a few days pass and another messenger comes and delivers him news that Lazarus has died. And so Jesus, uh, you know, as his disciples are squabbling amongst themselves about um, you know, do we go back? Do we stay? I mean, he's already dead now. What do we do? Um, Jesus comes to his disciples and says, you know, well, let's go to Bethany and be with his family. And the disciples continue to kind of squabble amongst themselves, um, you know, fearful that the things that have been threatened against Jesus in his life will come to pass and, and he'll, be, he'll be killed. He'll be captured and killed. And uh, Thomas, right, the disciple who... Uh, gets a bad rap as a doubter, looks at, at his fellow disciples and said, let us go that we may die with him. This recognition that this place to where Jesus is going is going to be dangerous and treacherous, but we're going to go anyway. Um, and we will share in Jesus's fate. And so um, Jesus and his disciples go to Bethany, and as they come near to the village, um, Lazarus's sister comes and greets him. And you have this whole exchange, you know, about um, my brother Lazarus is dead. Had you been here, um, he wouldn't have died. Had Jesus been present, death, this invasive, troublesome aspect of our existence, would not have claimed another human being because Jesus would have been present with that. Mary says that, you know, in, in that interchange, you are the Christ, you are the Son of God, and, and because you're the Son of God, you have this power over death. Why weren't you here? And Jesus, of course, asks her about, you know, well, do you believe in the resurrection of the dead, that, that this death isn't permanent? And she says, of course I believe, but it doesn't change the fact that he still lays there dead. And so Jesus and Mary and his disciples continue on, and Martha greets them and uh, basically gives Jesus the same spill. Had you been here, my brother would not have died. And seeing her grief and the grief of the other mourners who had come, Jesus began to weep. Um, and he wept in such a way that those gathered there looked and said, see how he loved him. See this, this deep bond between Jesus and his beloved friend. Uh, and Jesus, of course, asked them to take him to the grave, and he does. And uh, they see that it's it's in the rock-hewn tomb with a stone in front of it, and Jesus has removed the stone. And they they look at him and they say, "But Jesus, he's been dead for four days. You know, he, he's his body's going to stink. He, he's he's in a state of decomposition now. You know, you're you're too late." And Jesus looks at them in their disbelief and raises his eyes to heaven and you know says father i do this not for myself but for them that they may see and that they may believe and he instructs them again to remove the stone and uh, they finally agree to do it and they do and jesus looks at the grave and says lazarus come out 
and immediately the dead man comes out of the grave. And so he instructs uh, those gathered there to unbind him, to remove his grave clothes, uh, right? He would have been wrapped in linens and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. And the miracle there, of course, is that a person who's been dead for four days doesn't just get up and walk. That's not something that, that we experience in this world. It is outside of the realm of what is physically and scientifically possible. And yet, as people who follow Jesus, we believe not only that he has the, uh, the power and the authority to do these things, but that he himself was raised from the dead after three days. All of these things to say that we, when we remember that, that death is the enemy and death is the abnormal piece of of what's going on in creation. God's desire for life, God's desire to ease the suffering of those whom God loves, right? He loved Lazarus, he loved his sisters, he even loved those who had threatened to kill him. And Jesus exercised his authority not, not to get those, those Pharisees and Sadducees, or those religious leaders, off of his back, not to prove some kind of a point to them that you know his his power and his authority gave him some kind of special status over everyone else but he did it so that they and so that we who now hear this this um, telling of what God has done in the life of, of Lazarus so that we who hear these things may come to see what God's desire is for us that that desire is not death or weeping or grief um, and that what God does to work in this world that we call miracle is the standard that God has in store for us for the kingdom the same thing with the other miracles that I have mentioned the feeding of the 5,000 a sign of God's ability to take something that is that is finite that is that is small that in the scope of the needs of the world appears to be insignificant right five loaves of bread and two fish to feed 5000 plus people and that god's desire is to take those things and in blessing them and breaking them share them with everyone who is in need so that everyone has their fill and no one no one is left hungry so much so that there are even leftovers. The wedding at Cana, right? The, the uh, turning water into wine so that those gathered at the wedding feast can, can continue to celebrate this thing that God has done, right? God's continued activity and presence and authority over creation to provide the best that we may never want. The miracle is that even now, we as people of faith continue to see these things and consider them to be extraordinary, outside of what is normal. But for Jesus, these are the very things that God is giving us as the norm of our life. Jesus even tells his disciples, right, you, you have... Uh, you know, seen me do all of these wonderful things. You've seen me raise the dead. You've seen me um, feed this multitude. You've seen me heal all of these different ailments. And, and you've seen what the forgiveness of God's kingdom looks like in bringing people who are on the fringes of society back into communion with their neighbor. You've seen me do all of these things. And I tell you, my disciples that you will see even greater things than these. And in fact, you will do even greater things than these. That those of us who have been called to follow Jesus, to experience his, his words of mercy, to experience the gifts of his own abundance and his own life, will participate in them so fully that we will share them with a world in need of God's goodness in such a way
that it will be greater than even Jesus' miracles. And that's coming from Jesus himself. I don't think we can imagine what kind of a world that is. And I think when we look to these miracles of Jesus, the point is that we shouldn't have to imagine that kind of a world. It's been revealed to us in Jesus, in the witness of Scripture about these miracles, and in his call on our lives to be a part of them, both in receiving them through God's goodness and in sharing them in the name of Jesus with those in need. And so in thanksgiving for the miracles that God has worked in our own lives, miracles of healing, miracles of abundance, miracles of God's blessing, I ask you, people of God, will you pray with me? Almighty God, you raised up your friend Lazarus as a sign to all of your desire for life and for wholeness and as a foretaste of your own resurrection glory. Raise us up by the many miracles of new life which you have made known through the scriptures, the miracles of an abundant multitude being fed, of the sick and the lame and the dying being healed, and of the brokenhearted and the outcast sinners being made whole and restored to their neighbors in love and in mercy and in joy. Help us to see these miracles not as the abnormal ways that you break into this world, but as the standard for which you have called us into your kingdom promise. Raise us up in these and all of the things of our hearts, which we lift before you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.